Hi, it's Kevin again. In the last couple of videos, there should be a link nearby, I discussed the algorithm for finding the connected components in a mathematical graph. I decided that the animations I had to create to make that video were interesting enough to devote an episode to how they were made. Most of the animations showed manipulations of trees. For these, I was able to cheat cleverly and didn't need to do any sophisticated software development. All of the algorithm steps showed slow incremental changes, first in the building of the trees, and then in rearranging the trees to make them shallower. For these, I was able to use a lovely set of programs called GraphViz. These accept text files that describe a graph and can then produce the graph laid out in most popular image representations, JPEG, PNG, and the like, as well as most popular vector graphics formats, SVG, PDF, and so on. They can also report on the layout more abstractly. In particular, they can emit a JSON stream with the graphical objects. This stream was easy to parse using a packaged JSON parser. For laying out the trees, I used one of the GraphViz programs called DOT that is intended for creating hierarchical layouts just like this one. All of the changes that I was animating were small incremental changes to the graph, specifically each one simply relinked one subtree to a different parent. I noticed that the overall form of the layout remained unchanged when I did this. Essentially, the subtree moved to the correct position and everything else just adjusted its position by small amounts to make room for it. For instance, moving note F from lower right to the center doesn't do major disturbance to either of those neighborhoods. This suggested immediately that I could treat the individual tree states as keyframes and make in-betweens to animate them smoothly. I could take the coordinates of a node, or the endpoints of a straight arrow, or the knots of a spline, and interpolate them linearly between one state and the next. This gave the visual impression that a subtree that was relinked would glide smoothly into its new position while everything else jostled aside to accommodate it. That was exactly the effect that I was after, so for those animations I had what I needed. Peculiarly, the few seconds of animation to illustrate what connected components are turned out to be a lot tougher. Here I was trying to start with a bunch of nodes and then add edges between the nodes incrementally, showing the formation of components. When I tried to use the GraphViz programs to lay out the graph, the outputs varied wildly between incremental changes to the inputs. They were not at all useful for animation. I did find an option for setting the seed of the random number generator in Neato so that Neato would always give the same output for any given input. That didn't help at all with keeping placements close among incremental changes. After a few hours of playing with it, I decided I was going to have to implement my own approach if I wanted smooth animation. For the rest of this video, I want to discuss how I approach this sort of software development problem. One popular way to set up this sort of layout is to model it as a set of particles joined by springs. We confine the position of the particles to be inside a box. We set up a force that acts between each of the four walls in each particle that repels the particle proportionally to the inverse square of the distance to the wall. Particles also repel each other with a force proportional to the inverse square of their distance. 
Particles that are joined by an edge also attract each other with a force proportional to their distance. This attraction is how an ideal spring behaves. We choose the constants so that the forces balance out when the nodes are separated by an ideal edge length. In fact, we choose them to make the repulsive and attractive forces each be one unit at that distance. This force balance corresponds to aesthetic rules that we want to see in the rendering. Nodes should be as far apart as possible, provided that they stay in the box, and nodes joined by edges should be close to the correct distance apart. When the forces balance, we say the graph is pretty. For simple graphs, these rules are all we need for a nice layout. Now let's look at how I program them. In doing these things, I try to take an incremental development approach. I try to create as small changes as I possibly can. In fact, if I can do a change in an hour or two, that's an ideal situation. Each change starts with a small statement of what the program has to do, and each change ends by demonstrating that on a use case. For code I plan to share, at the same time I'll develop at each step test cases that exercise the new feature and cover the new code. Unfortunately, this is often not very well defined for GUI code. In general, too, I try to do the simplest thing that can possibly work. I don't try to get too sophisticated early. For the first use case, I want just to add nodes to a layout at random starting positions. I start with some of the usual boilerplate that's needed for any package in Tickle. I give the package name and version, and I create a namespace to hold the package's content. I'll group all the data for computing the layout in an object of a class called Spring Layout. I know up front the layout will need the boundaries of the region in a canvas that the display will have to fit in. plus a value that gives the ideal length for an edge. In addition, we'll obviously need a place to store node names and coordinates. In the spirit of doing the simplest thing that could possibly work, I'll use a hash table whose keys are the node names and whose values are coordinate pairs. The constructor is straightforward. It takes the region that we've designated for layout and the requested edge length, and stores them locally, and it initializes the set of nodes to empty. There's a method to add a node that takes the node's label, and a method to return nodes and coordinates. Adding a node assigns a random pair of coordinates. That's delegated to a private method random loc which chooses a pair of random numbers within the bounding box and no closer than one edge length to any wall of the box. And that's enough for a first test. I like coding package source files to include short demo programs that give an idea what the package is about, particularly if it's a user interface package. So let's work up a little demo of what we have so far. We load up TK and the package under test. We initialize the random number generator so those get the same answer every time we run. We create a canvas to show the results and put it in the UI. We create the layout and put nine nodes into it. And then we ask the layout for nodes and coordinates and draw a bubble on the canvas for each of the nodes. We have enough now to run our first demo. The demo shows just what we expected to see. Nine nodes scattered about at random. Now let's position them. The positions will be determined by balancing the forces that act on the nodes. For the repulsive forces, we don't need to consider edges, so we can do those first. When working with forces, it will help to have a few little utility procedures for vector algebra. 
I have these sitting around in an ad hoc package that I've never troubled to share. I'll just bring them in literally if I need them. Vmag calculates the magnitude or length of an n-dimensional vector. It squares the components, calculates the sum of the squares, and returns the square root of the sum. Vsum calculates the sum of two n-dimensional vectors. That's just summing the components in pairs. And s times v calculates the product of a scalar and a vector, which is just multiplying each component by the scalar. All of these are coded using functional techniques for compactness. I tweak the layout constructor to bring in these routines, and I might as well bring in the math functions and operators while I'm doing it. There are now some new public methods. Time step moves forward one step in trying to minimize the forces acting on the objects. It takes the size of the step to take. It starts by calculating the forces. We'll see how in a moment. Then it finds the maximum force and constrains the time step if any node will move more than 10 pixels in the step. Then it moves the nodes according to the forces acting on them. This method will be the basic framework for optimizing the layout. We put in a method that adds up the forces acting on each node. At present, the only force acting is repulsion from the walls. But this is where we will add the other forces. The max force method returns the greatest magnitude of the force acting on any node. And the move nodes method moves each node a short distance in the direction of the forces acting on it and proportional to the force. For an actual physical system, we'd have to accelerate the node rather than just moving it, and then take friction into account or the system would oscillate forever. But for this application, we're not trying to model anything physical. If this bothers you, think of this as the limiting case of a system where the nodes are embedded in a medium with infinite viscosity. The wall repulsion method calculates the force as the sum of repulsive forces from each of the four walls. It delegates the calculation to one wall repulsion to do the actual job. We choose the numbers so that the repulsion follows an inverse square law and has a value of 1 at a distance of L from the wall. Eventually, when we add the springs, we'll choose the spring constants, so the attractive force from a spring also has a value of 1 at distance L, which is what will fix the ideal le edge length. This brings us to another stage that's testable. We can expand the demo to run an update procedure once per video frame. What the procedure will do is call the time step method to calculate new node positions, and then go over the positions finding the center points of the nodes on the canvas, and moving the node centers to the new positions. What I expect to see is that the nodes will fly gracefully toward the center of the area, since the only force acting on them is repulsion from the walls. Am I right? It looks that way. So far, so good. The next step is to add repulsive forces between the nodes so that they don't all collapse into the center of the layout. It turns out that I'll need the difference of two vectors as well as the sum, so I'll copy and paste that in now. It just subtracts components in pairs. Next, we'll modify the forces method. For every node in the layout, we'll look at all the other nodes and add up the repulsive forces. We'll delegate to a new node repulsion method to do this. The repulsive force is governed by an inverse square law, which is again scaled so that it has a magnitude of 1 at a distance of L. So the natural separation of two nodes will be L pixels if they're linked by an edge.
nothing else has changed. We should be able to run this program with the new forces and see the nodes separate themselves. The nodes now arrange themselves against the walls because they all repel one another, but the wall repulsion contains them. Good enough. Next up is to add edges to the graph. They won't do anything. We just want to make sure that we can track which nodes are connected to which other nodes. I use a hash table to manage the edges. The keys are pairs of nodes, and the values are not used. The constructor sets the hash table initially empty. We'll throw in a method to add a new edge, making sure that the nodes are listed in order. and a method that retrieves the set of edges. We also do a bunch of GUI work that's pretty similar to what we've seen already to draw the edges and update them when the coordinates change at the time steps. I won't bore you with all the code. Once it's all together, let's try it out and see if the edges are tracked. The edges look to be in good shape. They don't have any function yet, but we can see what's connected to what. For instance, A is connected to B and D. We'll tackle next the issue of attaching springs to them. Adding spring forces to the edges is easy given what we already have. We need to update the forces method to examine the edges. For each step, it computes the attractive force using the edge attraction method, which we'll see soon. It then applies that force to one end of the edge, and an equal and opposite force to the other end. And we have a new edge attraction method that computes that force. It's a simple linear function of the distance between the nodes. The force is scaled so that it has a magnitude of 1 when the nodes are at the nominal edge length, so that it precisely balances the repulsion. And that's pretty much all there is to it. I added some examples to show it in action, including layouts where edges are added on the fly. This looked good enough to use to make the scene in the other presentation that animated adding links to a graph to show what connected components are, and that's pretty much where I've taken it. It's not too hard to see how a clever programmer could make an interactive graph layout editor out of this. When I did this, though, I was doing just enough to make progress with the presentation, and I haven't taken it any farther yet. I'll post the code somewhere and leave a link in the comments if you want to play with it. Next time, I'll be coming back to finding prominent peaks in an array. That technique depends on finding connected components, which is what prompted this digression. It's a technique that's really central to most algorithms that counter separate objects in an image. So stay tuned for that, and until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep calculating.